oh every time God. you log into Airbnb, it's saying, okay, this person may or may not be a hooker. This person may or may not be a drug dealer. They may be involved in criminal activity. And it's my fault because I didn't use a VPN, but it's also not my fault because what the fuck? Welcome to On the Horizon, powered by Sex Work CEO. A podcast about what's on the horizon for sex workers and how to navigate it, hosted by Jesse Sage and Melrose Michaels. Who misses free and affordable ads and social networks without the anti sex work rhetoric? Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising and social spaces to the sex work community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their two products, Tris.link and Switter.at, are refreshing and well-needed changes in both presentation and mission. Both are free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel encouraged and supported instead of policed. Check out their website, assembly4.com, for the word, not the number, for more info. So in the last episode, we spoke about the general war on whores, right? right. Mm-hmm. And the present day landscape that we're finding ourselves currently navigating. And versus that, in today's episode, we're going to have like further discussion along the lines of technology, censorship, surveillance, and how they're impacting sex workers today. Ooh, I know. Yeah. It's a mouthful. <laughs> and I'm really excited that I got it all out and didn't fuck it up. Well, yeah, that. And also, I'm like... Heavy. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot. Um, it also makes me want to break my brain uh-huh. last week. So yeah. we have two guests on. One is my husband. Um, <laughs> so I'm way more sappy than he is, and he's not here, so I get to be like that. He would be like, what are you doing? Stop it. Um, oh, they're so cute. But, but I like When them. he comes on, he blushes. So please tune into the video version because it's adorable. <laughs> no, so anyways, um, we're going to talk. We're having them on. Uh, we have on uh, PJ, who's my husband. Um, and, and then Adri Rose. And Adri Rose, uh, who's my friend, actually, but she doesn't make me blush. I just <laughs> like her. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we have both of them on. Um, they both have academic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. They're both writers. Um, PJ is a professor at University of Pittsburgh who studied um, um, digital digital sex work, actually. That's his specialty. And um, Adri's a writer and a photographer and a former escort, escort who's going to be talking to us about uh, navigating this surveillance and censorship. So Mm -hmm. both of them kind of talk about the ways that the internet um, both has opened up a lot of space for sex workers, but how it's also put us in, in danger that we can't really undo. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be aware of these things. And and I think this is a really important episode for a few reasons. So I think that we saw obviously this huge influx of sex workers come into the space over COVID and the pandemic Mm -hmm. who aren't probably as prepared because they don't have the experience that someone who's Mm -hmm. seasoned like us would have Mm -hmm. in terms of being safe on the internet, because a lot goes into that. Yeah. A lot goes into it. And it was, (laughs) I, when I, when the pandemic started, um, I had lots and lots of reporters reach out to me and ask me, actually, I should say this in two ways. I had a lot of people who weren't in sex work prior to the pandemic, um, ask me in my DMS for advice on how to get into the industry. I'm sure you did too. And I also had a lot of reporters asking me like what advice I would give to new people now that there's this like huge influx of people on OnlyFans. And, um, I felt like a Debbie Downer because I <laughs> Run, run away. No. I kept saying, um, is there anything else you could do? Like anything else you can do. And it's not because I don't like sex work because I actually love my yeah. job yeah. and I get a lot of meaning out of it, but it is a big fucking deal. And I think that people don't really understand that. Like yeah. you can't take it back. Like your face is, it's out um, there. It's out there. Forever. Yeah. Just and- let that soak in. <laughs> Forever. 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 And it will change the way you can navigate your world. And I think that that's a really important thing for people to understand. And for some yeah. people, it's worth the risk. For me, it turned out to be worth the risk, but you have to be willing to take, to take that on. And I think that not everybody 
is up for that. Yeah, and also I I love to to make this point too because a lot of people come into sex work, especially during this pandemic and the OnlyFans yeah. trend, thinking that it's just this easy way to make fast cash. And I <laughs> don't want that to be what you take away from this. Yeah. And I don't think you'll get that out of this podcast because yeah. it's the the work of sex work for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's not easy to be successful on OnlyFans. It's no. not easy to be successful in any you know vertical of sex work, whether you're a cam girl, whether you're full service, whether right. you're you know yeah. a dominatrix. All of these things are difficult in their own right they are labor yeah and it's not going to be that simple so making sure that you realize what you're getting into is a great yeah. i guess segue but then also if you're doing this in the tech space that comes along with a lot of risk that we we want to outline yeah yeah that we want to outline we want to talk about the way that um that these companies have all of our information the yeah. way that facial recognition software is being used against sex workers to keep them from crossing borders mm -hmm. to keep them from um having different sorts of um resources, and resources yeah. I guess is the best way to say that. And so, um, learning, learning what that surveillance looks like, learning how, um, we get, um, how we're both hyper surveilled, but then also how we're kind of um, erased on social media. Like most of us are under shadow bans for most yeah. of the time. And so looking at how like these platforms and institutions and banks and everything like, um, how sex workers have to interact with them differently yeah. than the general population, I think is really important. So that's what we're doing today. Yeah. Then the, the piece too, about like the shadow band specifically, cause that's what the majority of people who listen to this are going to be like, yeah. Oh, me too. Like yeah. absolutely completely a hundred percent relate. The other piece is like, it opens up this other thing that we didn't really talk that much about. Like, so I'm shadow banned on Instagram, even though I'm verified account, which yeah. is rare in and of itself. Right. And then even though I'm verified, I should be the number one person under Melrose Michaels that pops up and I'm not, it's all these like uh -huh. giant, catfish oh. accounts with like 20k 70k followers really? and so not only am i being erased <laughs> and like punished for my work um but even though i'm a verified account even though instagram says hey i recognize you you're id verified but i'm still gonna hide you from everyone looking for you yeah. like that's and insane like elevate the people who are catfishing yeah who are making money by <laughs> defrauding my fan base in my audience that i built over the last 10 years in sex work yeah, yeah. So, let, so let's jump right in. <laughs> yeah, so on that note, um, surveillance and... Uh, Censorship and technology. Yeah, okay. <laughs> PJ patella Ray is a porn industry and sex tech researcher. They have previously worked as an adult content creator and earned a PhD in sociology, studying labor and intimacy between cam models and clients. All right, so welcome. We're happy to have you on the horizon, PJ. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. He's my uh, husband for the people who don't know. That's why they're so giddy. <laughs> <laughs> You're my favorite guest. I was like, oh, familiar. <laughs> well, and it's funny because we also there. host a podcast together. So this is like particularly <laughs> unusual for us to be like on the other side <laughs> of the podcast right. hosting. But um, yeah, so I'm PJ patel Ray. I'm a so newly minted sociology PhD, and I am a uh my research is on sort of the new porn economy the digital porn economy and sex tech and uh i am a, a writer and an instructor in gender sexuality and women's studies so all of these different intersections that kind of come together for uh you know i think stuff you all are interested in yeah, talking yeah. About. extremely <laughs> qualified <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like you, you said, you've worked in both like tech spaces and sex worker spaces. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like that transition from like tech to sex work and how you think maybe um, tech is paying attention to sex workers or not um, and what your relationship to those two things have been? Yeah. Um, you know, I... <laughs> Okay, it took me a really long time to get my PhD. Um, I'll start with the fact that like I'm a cancer survivor. So I had cancer twice. We had a kid and we have two more kids <laughs> and we've had a lot of life in there. So I've been doing this whole like tech research thing on mm -hmm. and off for over a decade now. Um, but when I first started, um, I was really you know, interested in social media and like what was happening with social media. But like, you have to go back in the like time machine to like 2006, 2008. And like, you know, we were just 
getting away from MySpace <laughs> and Facebook and Twitter were new and exciting, right? <laughs> like, and it was just a different world. And I was really interested in like, what kinds of social change were going to happen mm -hmm. because of these technologies and like who was making the decisions behind yeah. these technologies and how that was going to affect social change. Right. So that was like, that's why I, and that's why I wanted to do a PhDs because I just thought that was really mm -hmm. important. And I spent a lot of my early years sort of fighting with, um, with some older colleagues <laughs> about like, does the internet even matter? Is it real? Is the wow, online real? Right? Like, so that's where the kinds of debates we were having at the time. I mean, it seems like so ridiculous now, right? After like four years of Trump tweeting, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not an yeah, argument we have policy. anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. You know, like making, like making laws through Twitter, yeah. right? Essentially. And, um, or firing people or whatever. <laughs> right. But back at the time we were still like, you know, very much caught up into like, you know, hackers, neuromancer, I don't know, matrix mm -hmm. kind of like the cyber space, <laughs> you know, true. like as this separate thing yeah. that, you know, you go surfing <laughs> in, but isn't like the real world. So it was like trying to shift the discourse to, to, to be like, Hey, real stuff is happening mm -hmm. online. Right. So, uh, you know, speaking of real life, like I, you know, also had to like live and um, I perhaps poorly chose to do a PhD in Washington, D.C., which is a very yeah, expensive. I was say, that's, yeah, that's a choice. And so, it, you know, my introduction to the world of sex work, I was like kind of also a festival kid. I was a lot around a lot of people who, you know did circus arts. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been like a passion of mine. I'm like terribly uncoordinated. <laughs> um, so I can't do do the arts, you know, or the music, but I, I photographed those for a long time. And I had lots of friends. And that was sort of my introduction to the world of sex work was like, how, how are people surviving in Washington, yeah. DC, who like, you know, aren't doing policy mm -hmm. jobs, right? right? You know, and so ultimately, I sort of went in that direction myself. And that's how I found myself in the sex work world. But really, like, it's, you know, also like, I don't know, I learned just moving there, like that, that sort of cultural, I don't know, the people who are doing like the cultural work in DC, like so many of them are depending on sex work for survival, mm -hmm. or just to like, get through, like, just to move from like, one thing they're doing in life, to another thing they're doing in life or to like be able to go back to school or like, I don't know, people get jobs mm -hmm. traveling like on cruise ships or whatever. And then you have to come home and you still have to like, you know, yeah. pay the bills until your next mm -hmm. gig. So, yeah. So that's, that was sort of how I, I, I landed in, you know, in that world. And then, you know, at some point as my funding was dwindling, I was, you know, also needing to, you know, find ways to pay the bills mm -hmm. myself. And that, that seemed like a, you know, attractive uh, way to do And you so. ventured into um, like the webcam then, arena, right? Is that how mm -hmm. you came into sex work? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I got into, I mean, I think mo most of my friends at the time were doing like in-person stuff, uh, you know, stripping mm -hmm. or something else. But yeah, I was always like really interested in, um, in camming, maybe also because I'm like a techie. Right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and so that's and, how and I got started. <laughs> <laughs> and been, so like i don't know it, it worked for me and i didn't have to dance so that yeah. was you know um uh but uh but yeah then you know jesse and i met and you know at some point you know we began to really do it in earnest as like a you know yeah. serious it's funny because job people like talk to me as if like he knows about this world because of me and he cammed before I met him. Oh, okay. Like I got into it because of him. Out of, out, because of him. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, those definitely, like definitely married my interest. So I like kind of stopped with research for a little while and like focused on mm -hmm. living. And then when I came back to research, I had been camming for a couple of years and I was like, duh, this is what I'm going to write my dissertation <laughs> awesome. about. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this is like, um, you know, I, I, I met so many interesting people and I like want to talk about these experiences and like what this new, like how this new economy is like changing porn, but also how it's like, um, you know, shaping technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I was like really attracted to it for, um, you know, 
as, as a research topic. And so that's where like, ultimately, you know, because of my experiences in the industry, when I came back into like mm -hmm. researching, like more seriously, that's really where all my research focus shifted. So those two worlds have kind of come together for me now. <laughs> You for a while were straddling both like just tech and then sex work kind of separately. And so you have this like uh, lens into how the tech world was paying attention to what was going on with sex workers or not. And so I'm curious if you could like talk a little bit about um, those overlaps. And I'm also curious if you could talk a little bit about the ways that like technologies actually um specifically like work against sex workers so um not the not the platforms but like how how are sex workers at risk because of the technology that we have in terms of like facial recognition software surveillance, and surveillance. um and yeah. um yeah i was curious if you could talk a little bit about that like for particularly for people on uh, online sex workers but also including in-person sex workers who put ads online, <laughs> like, you know, we're all kind of doing sure, our work sure. through the internet at this point, or many people are doing their work through the internet. Yeah. I mean, I would put the, I would put like the problems into two main baskets though. There's probably, you know, more, more that we could detail, but you know, and, and, and those baskets are, are surveillance and erasure. Like those are, I think the two, you know, main effects of Can a lot of these technologies. define erasure for people listening? Erasure is so like shadow banning would be a, you know, a, a perfect, you know, example of erasure where, um, you know, sex workers are simply made invisible mm -hmm. online. Right. So the kind of political organizing, you know, that we have been doing for years on Twitter and other platforms has become dramatically mm -hmm. harder over the last, you know, four -ish yeah. years as um, a lot of these platforms are instituting algorithms that basically make us unsearchable mm -hmm. and invisible to anyone who doesn't already yeah. follow us. Um, and then deprioritizes our posts, even for the people who do follow us. Right. And, and, you know, and of course this gets back to the sort of like, you know, this kind of war on yeah. sex that's mm -hmm. going, you know, or sexual content that's, that's been, been going on, you know, for the past several years, but, you know, it also has the, you know, the effect of, um, because, of course, um, you know, a, a lot of marginalized groups are overrepresented, mm -hmm. you know, in, you know, in the world of sex work. I, I think the statistic is, you know, more than 40% uh, percent of, of trans women of color have, you know, done sex work. Um, you know, so when you think about that, you know, uh, to say that, oh, we're making sex workers as invisible, is, you know, would then mean that we're making 40% of trans, yeah, people. You know, trans women yeah. of color. And, right. So the political ripple effects of, uh, of, you know, these policies of erasure are really pretty yeah. deep. And, you know, one of, again, back when I was a bright eyed, you know, young grad student wanting to serve, study the internet, one of the exciting things was, you know, we were looking at Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring and this idea that like, um, that social media would be this opportunity to get around these like old gatekeepers, mm -hmm. you know, um, at, you know, old newspapers and, and cable yeah companies and and the kinds of, again you know like boardrooms of white men making the decisions about you know who got to speak and who didn't get to speak right and and, and that was one of the really exciting things about the internet is that for like people in more marginal populations it meant an opportunity to actually have a platform in a way that was like really fundamentally previously unavailable and um and I think that's being lost. Yeah. Like, I really believe it's being lost. I think that the internet is taking a hard shift towards um, tighter and tighter controls, more and more gatekeeping in a way that is moving us in the direction um, of, you know, of, of silencing, you know, these same marginal voices who, you know, w once had an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to shine on the internet and going back to a world where, um, you know, where it's the people who occupy, you know, social positions of most power who, you know, get the biggest platform and everybody else has, you know, is left with the scraps. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that was always true, but yeah. I think even, even, you know, with the internet, but it's, 
it's you know was more true before the internet and i think it's more true now than it was 10 yeah. years ago and that so that that definitely explains the ratio and so what let's talk about the other bucket too yeah. Yeah. so you know the other thing then is surveillance and i mean i think the surveillance is really dangerous right so if like erasure is sort of politically dangerous uh you know and anti-democratic you know the surveillance is like you know that's what puts you in um contact with the police and makes you, you know, makes sex workers uh, vulnerable to, to state mm -hmm. violence, right? And we know that like sex workers are, are major, major targets of, of state violence, right? Like, especially with a lot of, of facial recognition technology, right? This has been a, a huge issue. Um, you know, it's been silently, or, you know, kind of creeping up on us. Mm -hmm. Um uh, Facebook has been developing this for years using our, our pictures. Google's been developing it for years. Many, you know, a lot of these companies have been, have been developing, um, facial recognition software using their like vast databases. Right. And only fans um, just started face and, mapping everybody too. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. Yeah, no, they're, they're and asking so, people one at a time. I just, Oh, the one. verification thing. Yeah, yeah that's they, true. They said they're face yeah. mapping, you know? Um, you have to use right. your ID and then do your face and they do all of the face mapping. Right, exactly. And so that's like, you know, meant to be like algorithmic verification, yeah. right? It's meant to, what they're saying is like, okay, well, we're not just, you know, we're using a, a tool to verify that, you know, you're not using someone else's ID mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Like, it, you know, is the idea, but, but there, of course, is real potential consequences mm -hmm. to how that data could be used. Um, and this is, you know, definitely one of the things that came up a lot in my research. Um, and honestly, I think it's been a shift just on like the climate of, you know, of online sex work is that um, it's, you know, at this point, even just with like Google image search, that's what I was it's gonna say. more or less. Yeah, that was always like the biggest, my own, that's my only data point or like experience really with how this has impacted sex work is that anyone can take a photo of me, reverse image search it, and then find like my Facebook or, yeah. you know, someone who else has posted me or looks similar to me. Like mm -hmm. that's so concerning. Yeah. And I've taught, definitely talked to lots of people who've like used strategies to try to mitigate this only using certain photos mm -hmm. on their adult sites versus, so, you know, mm -hmm. some photos on their private sites using specific filters, you know, but, you know, apart from what some escorts do, which is just to like not use your face at all. I think it's very difficult to, um, to really escape this, you know, facial recognition software. Um, I think it's so advanced at this point that, um, it's going to be able to to recognize most um, most people, though it is really racially biased. So people of color maybe have a couple more years. <laughs> they figure that out. You know, they're as vulnerable, but <laughs> um, but it's uh, you know, but yeah, and it's the same with tattoos. We should also yeah. say right. Mm -hmm. So that's a, you know, it, it, equally as as revealing as faces. And so you know, between those two things, you know, if you're doing sex work at this point it's you're pretty you know it's people are you're just a few clicks away from being doxxed and i you know and especially given that most of us you know especially like most young people already have like a huge yeah. digital data huge trail footprint. by the time they be yeah become adults yeah. and and it's not you know as we all know you can't purge that right mm -hmm. like you're not gonna you can't go and purge the internet archive. Yeah. Yeah. it's there mm -hmm. And so uh, even if you like erase your account or whatever, it's still going to be cached. And so it's, you know, I do think that I go back to 2008 or something like when I first was dabbling in the online world, you could kind of get away with having, you know, with like doing it stealthily. Uh, there weren't as many bots recording yeah, shows. Yeah, and, every you know, wasn't, piracy wasn't as intense, yeah. you know. Um, I don't think 
for the last 10 ish years, it's really been possible. Yeah, okay. I think at this point, like you, as soon as you step on cam, you're out. Yeah. You know, if someone wants to dox you, you know, it's easy for them to I like to that dox, you. dox piece because um, I don't like it. Never, the rephrase, <laughs> but the doxing yeah. thing is so important because I think a lot of, especially the new like influx of creators into like the digital online space, mm-hmm. they don't understand the concept thoroughly of like metadata. Like when you take a photo, yeah. there's right. data in that digital photo that you posted that people can extract right. and with something like OnlyFans that feels very social media we're uploading so quickly and there's no yeah. like edit process or you know, maybe a slight edit yeah. process but the data is still there what do you what can sex workers do I guess to help mitigate the metadata that maybe they're not even aware of I mean so yeah it's like a social and a technical issue right I mean yeah there are you know apps and programs that like will purge mm-hmm. your metadata but that, they're paying yeah, the ass. I it's, one. You know, it's a huge it's time useless. thing. Well, it's like it takes long. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we only have so much like time in the day, right? Like it's not good for our business model. Like you don't, you don't want to, like you want to be using your time doing activities that are going to like, you know, um, build your following and, or directly mm-hmm. earn money. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and scrape, you know, and purging metadata is not that. Right. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the more, practical solution is to pressure comp- you know platforms like you know um uh, only fans to build that technology yeah, into, into the platform you know, mm-hmm. into the platform so that it you know it's automatic and i think you know that provides you know, a little layer of safety but the truth is is i just i I think that we are fooling people if we give them too much hope. Yeah, I was that wondering that too. I was going to ask, do you think you identity. can actually be invisible online? Like I look at like Snowden interviews and I'm like, is there a way? <laughs> like, <laughs> is, can it be done? I mean, yeah. I, okay. Well, who is the you? If you are a full-time tech person whose life work is to remain invisible, then maybe you can get away with it ish. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you don't have other tech experts trying yeah. to do that, <laughs> right? Bar. If you're a normal person who's focused on making a living, yeah. then like hiding your identity becomes intention with that, right? In so many ways. And that's the hard part, right? And and I I don't think it's practical for most sex workers. Yeah. You know, to believe that you can hide your identity. I mean, if you can hide your home address, you've like really (laughs) succeeded. (laughs) And I think that's, you know, and maybe your social security, like that, that your phone number, like if you can keep those details Mm -hmm. out, you know, from being docs, then like I I consider that a major success. Mm -hmm. And I think even that is really, yeah, Yeah, I agree. Um, You know, and unlikely if somebody is really trying, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, again, I think some escorts, you know, really take um, strong measures, mm-hmm. um, high, obscuring their faces, using digital, yeah. you know, um, makeup to hide their tattoos. I think maybe, you know, some folks in those situations are more capable of it's hard though because it's like a different it's a different model though because if you're doing like online sex work you're also working very hard to obscure like your location whereas if you're an escort you actually need people to know where you are (laughs) what city you're in And, and and that's not even you know and we're not even getting into like you show up at the hotel and then the people you may know algorithm on facebook or instagram is like oh you're in the same room you must know each other you know here right mm-hmm. so like you know there's also lots of ways where you take all of these steps and then they're still outing you to the clients which of course if the client proves to be a problem decides they want to extort you you know turns violent mm-hmm. become you know a stalker like these things can be super dangerous so like you know it's all a matter of degree i'm not suggesting that people do mm-hmm. nothing but i also think that um and i think you can take measures that make your identity more obscure make it more work to mm-hmm. find yeah. you um but you know at the same time i think the idea that we can have actual like anonymy or, or anonymity mm-hmm. or like actually like totally obscure our identities or like live two separate lives um you know, I'm really dubious yeah. about that. And I mean, we've only talked about a few examples here, but like, 
I, you know, I, I do want to just, I'll point out a couple more, right? Like, so even where we live in Pitt, Pittsburgh, like, you know, Carnegie Mellon has been developing um, a lot of facial recognition software. They've been working on trafficking issues or so-called trafficking issues. But like one of the things they've been doing is building tools that scrape social media sites, scrape um, escort you know, ad sites and then match the pictures oh, wow. up using facial recognition so software, like creates a docs file of the sex worker. And then they give those tools to the police. That's so concerning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, it's it, so these, these tools are already developed. They already exist. It's right. like, you know, we'll see how much like police departments end up in investing in them. Mm -hmm. But like, it's really, you know, like, I, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's super concerning that, but, but law enforcement, you know, are, is, is already well into weaponizing mm -hmm. facial recognition, mm -hmm. same thing at the borders, yeah. right? They're doing the exact same thing. They've got, you know, files of sex workers. They're, they're doing facial recognition at the border. They're also looking at our phones, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, we've been through this experience, right, Jesse? Like you, you made the mistake of wearing fake, fake eyelashes through the yeah, border and the, the the border and they they took my phone well because i was working um i was we were going up there because i got hired to give a talk on mm -hmm. on dirty talk at a sex club in toronto okay and um because they had this like educational night at this club and so they were like oh you're a phone sex operator um can you give lessons on dirty talking and we were like yeah that sounds great and we're going across the border and they ask us why are you going i'm teaching a class well where are you teaching the class and then they i was wearing false eyelashes because we were dry we we live close enough to toronto that i was like on my way Great to the day yeah. you know and um they took my phone went through all of my social media they they went through all of the stuff they had to sit there three hours maybe um and then we heard um we heard the supervisor say to the person that was reading all of my twitter and everything um it's your choice. Uh, you can send them away or you could let them come through. And ultimately she let us come through, but it was very clear that like, that might not be a possibility that I might be um, wow. unallowed to enter into the country. And um, when I'm quite sure now that my real name and my sex worker name are linked up because in their records. Yeah. It would have and, to be. Yeah. It would have to be. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and that was and that was because they thought I was working, you know, wow. and they wanted to see exactly like what I was doing. They can working. just take your phone like that? Yeah. That's insane. Did you are you obligated to unlock it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's again, I mean, I mean, you had somewhere to be, so I'm sure you guys weren't like, let's like exercise all our rights and really get you to the bottom of this, but <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I think because it was like kind of ostensibly like a, a educational thing they were like it's our prerogative to decide if we're going to classify this as sex work or as something that's like not sex work and ultimately they were like uh okay just go wow. but um but i went and gave a talk at academic conference a year later in canada and was driving and i asked the the per the person who organized can you please write me a letter saying i'm going to be at this conference because i was very concerned that i was going to be denied entry wow. so yeah yeah and i mean if you don't comply to with all of their requ invasive requests i mean they're absolutely not getting across yeah. the border like you may or may not get prosecuted but you're you're 100 percent going That's home you know like this, it, is, this is not not that this is kind of a tangent but there's this guy i follow on tiktok who works over the border in the u.s but he lives in mexico and, and he has i don't know if, what his situation is, but he's legally allowed to be here and yeah. work and do his thing um so he films himself coming through border patrol every time on tiktok and they ask him all the questions they ask me out of the car he's like i know my rights i'm not getting on the car i know my rights i need yeah. to go and then he like he kind of educates through tiktok on all of your rights at border patrol stops and all these things yeah so i'm just wondering in yeah. this capacity of sex work how that would really look if if it came down to like a legal like uh -huh. a, a lawyer litigating yeah. with border patrol practices how it would look that's super interesting right. I mean, if you had like a green card or dual citizenship or something, that'd be like a completely different story because then you because but entering as a visitor, yeah, yeah, sure. you really don't have any rights like you, you they can just turn you away. So I, you know, I, I think that's um, 
Yeah, those are interesting questions, though. And I'm, I, I mean, obviously, those are like questions for an immigration lawyer. But, you know, the, but the point is, is that there is tons of surveillance okay. at yeah. the border. And that's one of these points where being a sex worker, you know, you're really vul- vulnerable to like state, you mm-hmm. know, um, surveillance and sa- surveillance, you know, and potentially like, you know, um, contact with the police in ways that you know could be yeah, dangerous so at least at the borders it's well documented and there's yeah, cameras everywhere yeah. right you know it's actually much more dangerous you know when you're you're getting pulled over something like that yeah 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 i mean i think that like a lot of um a lot of the reasons that escorts don't have their faces or have their faces blurred out on their ads is particularly because of this, because they would like to travel internationally and you don't want to be detained. And there's already like databases of sex worker faces. Um, So, yeah, I mean. So, I mean, I think these are all important points. I just want to like come back though and say that, um, you know, I, (laughs) This has been fairly pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of things to worry about. Mm-hmm. I think these concerns are real. I think people are really harmed, you know, by by st- like state surveillance, by you know these contacts with the police, by you know being denied, you know, the ability to cross the border, and, and so like there's a lot of reason to be mm-hmm. concerned and pessimistic. On the other hand, I don't want to be so extreme where people are walking away from this feeling like, well, there's just nothing I can do. So I'm screwed. And therefore, I shouldn't do anything. um, Because that's not right Mm -hmm. either. I mean, we can, you know, there are harm reduction measures you can take, right. And I, I think that you know, obscuring your identity to some degree is still better than doing yeah. nothing at all, mm-hmm. right? Like making it take three steps for somebody to figure out who you are instead of one step still makes you safer in a lot mm-hmm. of cases. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, there are great organizations like Hacking Hustling, you know, that um, sometimes, you know, will produce um, various like guides and zines and, you know, um, uh, that help, um, you know, help, help, mitigate help risks. you yeah. navigate these systems and, you know, put safety measures in place, even if those safety measures aren't perfect, you know, or aren't absolute, you know, can still be the difference between harm and not yeah. harm mm-hmm. in some cases. And so I think like, you know, we shouldn't spiral into, <laughs> you know, like, nihilism or something like like there are still things we can do and those things matter Mm -hmm. and you know and we should and we should take precautions even if at the end of the day like you know if 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 somebody really really wants to find us they probably can and and so we also have to be real about that absolutely those are just the ba- that's the balance we have to yeah well i think that's a good place to end where can people find you and your work Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter as PJ Ray, and we will be coming back with more exciting peep show mm-hmm. content here and soon. So if you want to keep your eye on uh, peepshowpodcast.com or peepshowmagazine.com, you'll find uh, you know more from myself. And <laughs> uh, Great. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Yes, it's great to meet you. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. All right, we'll see you. Adri Rose is a Pittsburgh based freelance writer and portrait photographer. As a writer, she covers sex, sex work, black mental health, and culture. Welcome, A.G. Rose, to the show. We're super excited to have you on Horizon. For the people that maybe are a little less familiar with you, can you introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Uh, my name is Adri Rose. I am a former escort um, writer and freelance photographer living in Pittsburgh. Um, super happy to be here and just grateful to be invited. Oh, Thanks. That's so sweet. Yeah, I'm <laughs> glad. You've been on Peep Show before, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the work that you've done on surveillance of sex workers Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your writing and also your like academic work. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like how technology like interferes with sex workers in terms of 
making money, advertising, safety, mm -hmm. law enforcement, all of the things. <laughs> sure. Um, so full disclosure, I'm a former grad student. I dropped out earlier this year best decision I've ever made in my entire <laughs> life but uh, <laughs> the research that I was doing I mean I am a sex worker was a sex worker until the pandemic forced me into quote-unquote retirement so mm -hmm. that kind of work being online especially as a writer and a photographer there's really no getting away from how sex work changes how you're able to move and interact with people online a huge part of what i focused on was social media moderation especially post sesta fasta because mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with it it's dual legislation that really puts the onus on how content is moderated on social media websites not just social media websites but forums basically any website that hosts any kind of sexually explicit content they're now held legally responsible for any trafficking be it real or imagined mm -hmm. that's going on on these websites mm -hmm. and so a lot of them especially social media sites have gone full out balls to the wall in terms of their moderation policies facebook instagram whatsapp that whole umbrella they've basically made it impossible to talk about sex in any way yeah. so whether you're a sex worker or you're black you're fat you're queer whatever it is simply talking about sex puts you in a really precarious position because all of these sites rely on algorithms they rely on an automated process in order to combat what they call inappropriate content and mm -hmm. so if you if a site like Tumblr is using an algorithmic process that goes after quote unquote flesh tones, which is exactly what happened, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you see a lot of the aesthetic Tumblr blogs that posted a lot of nude and pink colored imagery. They're getting taken down and they're being told that it's because they're porn blogs and they're posting inappropriate content. If you're yeah. on Instagram, you know that use of like the eggplant or peach emojis or even the, um, the water droplet emojis, it's a great way to get your account suspended yes. because they're saying that you're mm -hmm. posting sexually explicit content. So a lot of what we're seeing in response to SESTA FASTA is people and websites, platforms, companies, whatever, instead of putting in the effort to actually determine what is and is not explicit content, they're simply saying anything that might possibly misconstrued as explicit content is now against the rules. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, how can you talk like more um, tangibly then about, so earlier you said, well, if you've ever engaged in the sex trades in any way, like it impacts how you can move through space. Like, so how, mm -hmm. how does that impact now you're a writer and a photographer. So how does like having a past in sex work, like impact how you can navigate online spaces? So one of the most shocking, and it's not really shocking. I've been doing this for a long time, but I think oh, one, of most, <laughs> one of the most, one of the most irritating things is simply the ability to travel. Um, if you've, used uber lyft you've ever stayed in a hotel i'm sure especially as a sex worker you've seen imagery or language revolving around how to spot a human trafficking victim and a yeah. lot of it is targeted explicitly at single women especially mm -hmm. single women who travel without a luck without a lot of luggage as someone that loves to take the train and has never been crazy about planes I don't like to travel with a lot of luggage because yeah. I have to carry it places. Yeah. Yeah. So checking into a hotel with a weekender bag or an overnight bag as a single woman, it's a pain in the ass because you get a lot of stares. You get a lot of questions mm -hmm. that are really invasive and they're clearly targeted, but they're coming from people that don't know what they're talking about. They went to a corporate training seminar. Yeah, and it's exactly. not their fault. <laughs> they're just doing their best. They're doing their jobs, but it makes it a pain in the ass to simply go anywhere and do anything. And mm -hmm. it's funny. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was traveling home for my sister's engagement party. And I wanted to book an Airbnb because 
staying in a hotel is a pain in the ass. So, (laughs) I mean, I got through the whole process. We had picked out, um, we had picked out an apartment that we were going to stay in and we were going through the booking process and Airbnb would not let me check out. And I thought, okay, I'll reset my browser, like, um, reset the cookies or whatever. So I logged out, reset the browser, um, logged back in, and I got an email from Airbnb telling me that my account had been suspended for suspicious activity. And I'm like, what the hell is happening? And then I remembered small bit of research because it's not really my area of expertise but a couple years ago I read that Airbnb had taken on a new patent and I never really looked too much into it but they are using a patent that every time you log in it scrapes basically all of your internet activity and everything you've ever done in that browser and they weigh it against an algorithm that measures how likely you are to engage in criminalized or antisocial behavior that's their language not mine but every time you log into airbnb it's saying okay this person may or may not be a hooker this person may or may not be a drug dealer they may be involved in criminal activity and it's my fault because i didn't use a vpn but it's also not my fault because what the fuck (laughs) yeah exactly Exactly. that that explains a lot of my problems with airbnb i had no idea because i would like i booked something through one account and i couldn't get back in my account like what the fuck's going on what did i do wrong i don't understand What do you think that the biggest issues that sex workers face in terms of technology and surveillance currently, like the ones that stand out to you? I think the biggest issue that I come across is that a lot of people just don't have a great concept of internet hygiene outside of the absolutely gargantuan hoops that we're forced to jump through as sex Mm -hmm. workers that in and of itself is a problem, but I think a lot of people just have really bad internet hygiene. I just saw a post on Twitter a couple of hours ago where someone um, was posting about their new townhouse and they posted a picture of their key in focus and the very next picture was their license plate unblurred wow. out. And that sort of... <laughs> Now, as someone that's been an internet whore for a very long time... <laughs> It makes me extremely uncomfortable, but that's yeah, very yeah. basic internet hygiene. Mm-hmm. It's not difficult to look up someone's license plate number and find all of the information that's attached to it. It yeah. might co- you might come out of pocket two or three dollars, but it's not yeah. a difficult process. Yeah. But as a sex worker, all of that is amplified so much more. Um, I know that Proton Mail is really popular among criminalized people because they have this whole thing about we don't sell your information we won't give up your private information and now proton mail is in the news they're in the headlines because they handed over someone's ip address as part of an investigation Mm -hmm. i think that a lot of people take what corporations and what websites and platforms are saying at face value and they don't take it upon themselves to look into how they're actually protected legally. Mm-hmm. Websites can say a lot of things. Yeah. But that, like, it's not always in good faith, if that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, what, um, so now we're talking, we're talking a little bit about surveillance now. What about things like, um, how sex workers are kind of like silenced online, like shadow banning? What sort of impact do you think that has on the community? <laughs> Um, the impact is really hard to estimate because you can't see it, right? Yeah. Um, we're being shadow banned, we're being silenced, we're being deplatformed. But uh, hacking, hustling, the organization, I guess you can call it, formed mm-hmm. by Mistress Blunt and a couple of other sex worker activists, they've done a lot of work mm-hmm. looking at like tangible representation of how Mm -hmm. that kind of deplatforming affects us. But I think the most real, the most felt consequence is that people don't have community. I was screeching about this after OnlyFans decided that they were going to take down all the explicit content, but this happened when Backpage went down as well, right? Mm -hmm. Losing that kind of online community overnight never has the effect that you think or these companies think Mm -hmm. that it will. What does happen is people lose their community overnight and then 
they're forced out onto the street. It happened when Backpage went down. Mm -hmm. I know because I was on Backpage at the time when it went Mm -hmm. down and friends that I had made, people that I had built a community with, they ended up on the street the next day and within a week or two weeks, I didn't hear from them anymore. People, wow. people that had ads up on Backpage when it went down, the very next day they started getting hundreds of text messages from very obvious pimps and cops trying wow. to trap them into some kind of situation. The same thing happened when people were like flipping out about OnlyFans. I don't know how many screenshots I saw of DMs with people saying, hey, I know that you know, you lost a lot of income from OnlyFans. I have this group of yeah. girls that, yeah. you know, we work together and they get to keep 80, 90% of their money. I don't take a huge percentage. That's a pimp. <laughs> and yeah, I that's, a pimp. that's a whole new concept that's coming out yeah. of tech. And I, I've discussed this with people before. I'm like, we have this, you know, this term pimp and it's problematic its own way, its own ways. But now we have this like cyber version of it with these like men, usually white men in the middle of God fucking knows where. Yeah. And they're reaching out and they want to take like 50% of your earnings and give you quote unquote traffic and marketing. I'm like, well, my background's in marketing. I don't see why I need that. I need yeah. a fine job on that. And then traffic, <laughs> like what traffic can you get that I can't access? There's there's right. not a lot of routes for traffic acquisition and sex work in general mm-hmm. beyond social media. So unless you're buying massive shout outs and spending money on media, there's nothing you're doing that the average sex worker couldn't do themselves. They're right. just right. not. So I don't understand what the value add there is. It's, it's definitely, it's like entrapment. I, I think the issue is that a lot of people that have only ever been on many vids, only fans, a mm-hmm. lot of people that have only ever done o- online sex work don't know this. They don't understand the overlap, I want to say, between online and offline sex work. Mm-hmm. To them, a pimp is a very specific thing. Their yeah, idea yeah. of it is influenced very much by true crime and SVU yeah. and these yeah. shows that rely on a very specific narrative. So when they run into, I said this before, most of the pimps that I know are college educated, middle aged mm-hmm. white women. They own brothels, they own agencies, and they take a huge percentage of people's earnings because they're providing something like safety. They're providing a place to sleep at night. They're providing regular meals, those sorts of things Mm -hmm. that you, that are maybe less common when you work offline, but when Mm -hmm. you work online, those sorts of things I think are less of a concern than the technological safety aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But people have a very specific narrative of what a pimp is in their head. Mm -hmm. So when they think about technological safety, that it doesn't ring the same bells as, oh, a pimp is someone that's going to beat me up. They're going to sell me to their friends. They're going to steal all of my money. Those same bells are not ringing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't yeah. see it as, as maybe as exploitive. I, you know, what's interesting too. There's a lot of talk about like the newer generation. They're just not tolerating the model of a nine to five. Like why should anyone want or do need to do yeah. that? We can be as <laughs> yeah. effective doing it this new way. So I think that, do you think that some, I guess the newer generation's outlook on things is impacting the workforce in general? So I, I think As a, I guess you can say mid-generation millennial, Mm -hmm. I think that I occupy a really interesting ideological space where I bought the, you go to high school, you graduate, you go to college, Mm -hmm. you get a good job. And I bought into it and I went to college and I did undergrad and I went to grad school. And in the midst of grad school, when I was paying $1,800 a month to live in a fucking studio apartment. Mm -hmm. And I realized that selling my body was the only way to make a living Mm -hmm. that would also cover or that would also make room for this continued hectic schedule that Mm -hmm. I was told was the key to a good life. In in that, in the midst of that process, I realized this is bullshit. And I think what we're seeing with Gen Z is that, they were never sold the lie because Mm -hmm. older millennials and mid-tier millennials, younger millennials, those are their parents. Those are their siblings. Gen X also kind of got the raw end of the deal towards the end there, but 
I'm a Gen Z. Local sold that yeah. and wish I wasn't. Yeah. I, yeah. Like the generation, the two generations before, I think, bought into it and they realized a little bit too late that right. it was bullshit yeah. gen z was never sold that that didn't stop people from trying but they simply never bought into it mm-hmm. and so this is a conversation that comes up a lot um with people on social media where they say oh well when you go on tiktok there's always someone on there saying become a stripper become, become an only an fan only fans star yeah. like they're grooming kids are they or are they just telling yeah. younger people that like you don't have to go get a shitty job you don't right. have to destroy your body by the age of 35 to maybe get health insurance yeah. and to get one and a half days a week to yourself and you mm-hmm. pop out a couple of kids and then you die like yeah <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. is with i mean okay if you want to have kids cool do it but like for a lot of people how do you first of all how do you afford children i don't get it i mean we're a double income no kids household but my partner is disabled so even if i was still working as an escort i'm setting him up to for a felony yeah Yeah. (laughs) true right right. i wonder too because 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 of that gen that difference you know generationally if that impacted the success and the timeliness of something like OnlyFans, because you have this generation that's like i'm not going to do the traditional thing and then you have this platform was like hey i'm a big option and it's kind of like mainstreamy and it's kind of social media (laughs) but it's kind of porn and uh i wonder if that was just the formula that was like bound to fucking work because of the timing yeah is there anything else that you think that we didn't ask you about that seems important and this conversation oh goodness um i don't think there's anything that was really missed i would just say stop admitting to doing felonies on the internet please god (laughs) great advice (laughs) <laughs> great advice There's one it, is, <laughs> it is unsettling how common it is every day I see it and I feel like an old woman like shaking her fist <laughs> at the sky every time I see it like I someone the other day or not the other day it was a couple months ago but someone was saying that they wanted to create an ebook on all the best ways to be a porn star and I was like no don't do that that's called facilitation and that's a felony and people got very upset with me and they were like well you're gatekeeping and unlike you I'm a real whore I don't just study them and I was like well I don't tell people that I'm a whore on the internet unless it's very clearly a shit post because that's a felony (laughs) that's why I don't do that well thank you so much for talking to us where can people find you and your work um, yeah, so I am on Twitter and Instagram at Adri Rising. That's A D R I E R I S I N G. Or if you want to hire me for legitimate, non felonious purposes, my website is AdriRose.link. Okay, perfect. perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so what do you take away from this other than, like, we're fucked? Is there something else? (laughs) There's good things, too. There's things we can do, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I feel like we heard was, like, don't be low-hanging fruit. Like, don't Mm -hmm. be an easy target. Take some necessary steps. Right, yeah. So I think that was important. Um, And also just understanding, like, anything online is forever. We talked about that in the intro. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be there. Right, yeah. Uh, And more people see things than you expect yeah yeah and there's more information and data attached to everything you're putting out than you're realizing right right I think, that's and so I think it's really important to think about like uh, you know and I think this is another thing that I that we actually didn't really like talk about but in terms of um on the thing but in terms of business while we're talking about um you know the fact that everything is there forever I mm-hmm. think when you first get into sex work it's really hard to wrap your head around the fact that you're creating a brand yeah like, you feel like you're just doing a thing yeah um but that thing is actually really important because I think it's 
until it happens, I think it's hard to recognize that as a sex worker, you're also a public figure. figure yeah. And, and you're the, out there open for, you're vulnerable, you're exposed, you're, yeah, you're open for like scrutiny and stuff. So I think it's important to not only think about like, how do you go about scraping the metadata from your uh, Content, pictures so yeah. that people don't see you. If you're a camera if you, and you want to, how do you go about like um, setting up geo blockers so mm-hmm. that your neighbors aren't watching you? You know, there's all sorts of things to think about, but I think it's also important to think about like, how are you presenting yourself to the world? Because more people are going to see that than you know, or than you Yeah. Expect. And just some of the stuff that we touch on too, just like the easy things, like don't photograph your license plate. Don't accidentally catch your neighborhood or a neighbor's house yeah. number in an mm-hmm. Instagram clip or story. Right. Um, these yeah. are things that are easily avoidable, but you just, you do have to think about them. You do have to think about them. Yeah. yeah because as sex workers, I think we have to think about our, we have to think about our safety. We have to think about our identity. There's a reason that we all use pseudonyms, yes. you know, and yes. I think that, um, yeah, and the the way that we interact with technology is important for our own safety. Yeah. And so it's it's really good. And you know, and the other um, point that Adri Rose kept hammering home for for the people who do like full service work, like don't don't admit to felonies. Yeah. Online. You know, like it <laughs> yeah. seems so simple, but like you know, we do have to think about like how how we talk about our work, especially if our work is criminalized, and how we talk about um, our lives if we want to protect our privacy in our lives. Yeah, and I think that's a great point too. Is that like even when we're speaking like on a podcast, there's things we have to be sensitive of. Like there's things you can't say. There's information you can't give because it's putting our community at risk. Right. So making sure that we're conscious of that, but then also we can work with the community. Like if there's a, a tool you need or something, you can reach out to us directly at yeah. any time mm-hmm. to get more resources. Yeah. Um, maybe things that we can't just outwardly announce on the podcast. Yeah. Because <laughs> we can't admit to anything either. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but for a tangible takeaway too, I think there's some things we can do as like entrepreneurs or as adult entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Like um, one thing I mentioned is Metfo. It's a really great app to take away yeah. your metadata from photos before you post them. Yeah. Um, we talked about signal. Yes. yes. Signal. Using signal instead um, of telegram, like gotta yeah. do that. <laughs> gotta do that. Um, um, yeah. VPNs, VPNs. Even if you're like doing webcam, using a VPN while you're live streaming is really crucial. It's important. A lot of uh, trolls have come into my chat room and re- did my IP address and shot me my location. That's wow. happened before. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this is a, a good thing to consider. And then I guess even we didn't touch on so much the shadow ban aspect of it, but there's things you can do to get around that too. Like if you really pay attention to the things coming out of Instagram and then new features that they're putting out like ig guides for example which no one uses which i'm like the only one i know using guides that's how i post your sex work ceo blogs to instagram is the guides feature yeah or like using reels i didn't know what it was i was like wow okay (laughs) this looks nice um or reels like reels is a great way to break out on instagram and kind of not i guess break out of the algorithm you can't like you know, overcome an algorithm, but you can break out of it and kind of stand out. Just utilizing those features will help push you outside of your shadow ban a little bit. Um, And also making sure you're not doing some of the things Adri mentioned uh, to get shadow ban. Like don't use emojis that are highly sexualized. They're looking for that in their algorithm. Don't use um, flesh colored lingerie. I always advise models not to take pictures in nude lingerie. I do have one up. Don't come for me. I know it's there, (laughs) but it's lit and it's ran through Lightroom. So it's okay. Um, But these are things we can do to kind of overcome some of that challenges in tech um yeah. while i'll also be an early adopter too like don't be afraid of technology just make sure you're doing it the right way yeah 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 and i think that that's that's another thing is like we don't want everybody to leave this episode and think like oh <laughs> I, I, I can't i can't use twitter i can't use instagram i can't use these things because you know big tech is coming after me that's kind of true except that we have to use them yeah. so we have to figure out like a balance between you know not uh, between being aware of the harms mm-hmm. and also figuring out how to how to navigate this world that we live in because yeah. this this is the world that we live in. This now. is where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on another episode of On the Horizon, a podcast about what's on the horizon for sex workers and how to navigate it. I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual and at jessiesage.com. And I'm Melrose Michaels, and you can find me on social at Melrose Michaels and melrosemichaels.com. If you want to support the podcast, please go to anchor.fm slash horizon, spelled W-H-O-R-I-Z-O-N, to pledge any amount per month so we can keep putting out the content you love.